that. Literary devices, how to notice them, if we have time. Um, we'll think about the PE technique and as well as um, as well as that process of elimination and a bit of time management stuff. So we've got a lot to cover today. Now, just uh, before I get into things, um, we will, because there's a lot of you, uh, we will do this um, like without any of you speaking out loud. So please uh, keep yourselves on mute the whole time. Uh, don't unmute because it will become confusing. And if you do want to answer a question or give any, any ideas at any point, please use the chat. I will do my best to read through as many of your um, suggestions as I can, but please do not spam the chat. I will do my best to read what I can, but there are a lot of you. So if you don't get your answer read out loud, that doesn't mean I didn't see it. That just means there's a lot. So please, for my, for my sake and for everyone else, do not spam the chat. Just send your answer through once, please. And after the um, this hour, this masterclass, which will last until one o'clock, there will be a 15 minute Q&A for parents at the end. So if any of your parents do want to come on and ask myself um, or Kanksha, another Pi Academy member, um, any um, questions or any queries that you have, please do encourage your parents to join then. So um, let's begin. Uh, so. The first thing I want to clarify, which uh, I think is always worth knowing, is what is inference? So I'm sure you all know what inference is. At this point, you may be familiar with it and you've probably practiced it plenty. So let's just go over what we know and be as specific as we can. So inference is another way of saying reading between the lines, right? So instead of just saying what you can see on the page in you have to think a little bit more deeply. You have to go a little bit beyond what the uh, what the text might be saying on the surface. And there are different ways that you can practice this. And we're going to think about three different kind of skills you can practice to improve your inference skills. Now, let me just do a little move that around. Um, you can see in the little image that I have got there for you, um, we've got a little cartoon there, which I think sort of illustrates. Um, a bit of inference, how inference works. So just to start us off, look at that little image that I've put in the corner there. This is a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon, if anyone's ever heard of Calvin and Hobbes. See if you can infer from the information you've been given in that image, what can we infer about Calvin? How is Calvin feeling based on that image? Can anyone tell me in the chat? Look at what it says, look at his expression, look at what they're doing. What can you infer is going on in Calvin's mind? He is frustrated, he's envious, he's angry. Yes, why? Why is he angry? What can we infer? He's jealous. Okay, you're all saying his emotion, but why? What's he emo why is he feeling that emotion? Excellent. Okay, lots of you have got this. He did not get a good score on the test. Yes, clearly. You can see that this uh character is called Susie. Susie got a good grade, and he's rather cross that he didn't get that same grade. Okay, so let's start by thinking about some different skills you can practice uh, to improve your inference. The first um, type of inference or the first skill that you can practice is deduction. Now, you may be familiar with what that word means. To deduce something uh, means to like work something out based on evidence that you get given, solid evidence, right? So you can see I've got a little picture of Sherlock Holmes there. This is when the information in the text is very clear. So there, it's still being inferred because there is using evidence rather than you know a clear statement, but it's very obvious what the answer is. It is very clear. So you might find that if, if a question is involving deduction, you will be answering something like, this must be, or it must be this, because it's a very clear and sure um, 
the statement that you're making. So um, in this, we're going to practice deduction with a, a little passage that I've got from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. I'm going to read this passage through and I want you to just put in the chat things that you can deduce about Charlie's life. And the way that you would do this in the chat is you have to give me the piece of evidence that tells you and then what you can deduce from that. OK, so this is very clear. We're making very clear inferences that have a specific piece of evidence that proves that they are true. So let's do a zoom in a little bit so it's easy to read. OK, let's read it through and then I'll see what your deductions are in the chat. The whole of this family, the six grown ups, count them, and little Charlie Bucket, lived together in a small wooden house on the edge of a great town. The house wasn't nearly large enough for so many people, and life was extremely uncomfortable for them all. There were only two rooms in the place altogether, and there was one bed. The bed was given to the four old grandparents because they were so old and tired. They were so tired that they never got out of it. Grandpa Joe and Grandma Josephine on this side, Grandpa George and Grandma Georgina on this side. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket and little Charlie Bucket slept in the other room upon mattresses on the floor. In the summertime, it wasn't too bad, but in the winter, freezing cold drafts blew across the floor all night long and it was awful. There wasn't any question of them being able to buy a better house or even one more bed to sleep in. They were far too poor for that. Okay, so what can you deduce about Charlie's life? What are the clear conclusions you can come to based on what we've just read? So I'll read out some of the answers in the chat. Okay, so they are very poor. We can definitely deduce that, that his life is uncomfortable. He lives a miserable life. Yes, we can definitely deduce that life is not fun for Charlie. His family are very poor. His life is very miserable. They don't earn much money. Yes, good. Most of the answers are saying basically that exact same thing. They can't afford a bed, so it's just that they are very poor. His life is hard. The house isn't very insulated. That's true. There's a tight space. Yes, good. The house is cramped. They can't afford another bigger bed or a bigger house. They are destitute. Excellent. So I think that's fairly clear, isn't it? Right. This is deduction. You don't really need to like think much below the surface. It's pretty clear, but you're still using the clues, right? You're still using the evidence in the text, the various you know facts about Charlie's life to deduce what life is like for him. So here are some of the things that I said. The Bucket family are poor. They don't have a lot of space. The house is not well insulated. They don't have much money and the grandparents are in poor health. So those things are all very clearly, um, you can deduce them clearly because they are supported by very specific words and phrases in the text. So deduction, very clear answers. Now the next thing that you can practice is called speculation. Now, before I put my slide up, um, does anyone want to like put in the chat what they think speculation means? If you speculate about something, what does that mean? Speculate. I can see a couple of good answers. Yes, a theory or a guess. A couple of you have got this. Estimating, predicting, guessing. Yes, good. I mean, that's the thing. With, with speculation, you are actually being a little bit more imaginative, right? So deduction is you're finding a very clear piece of evidence in the text, right? You, There's no question about it, really. It's a clear inference. With speculation, you're kind of thinking more broadly about other possibilities that might not necessarily 
be as clearly stated. So speculation doesn't require concrete evidence. So this is something you can practice for, you know, more broader, longer texts. So you can make a broader assumption about a character based on the information that you get. There might be an absence of specific evidence. And then you might use words like might. They might have this or they might have been through this as opposed to must, which we had in the other one. So now I've got the same passage again. I won't reread it, but this time see if you can speculate about Charlie's life. So the things that might not be specifically said in the text, but they could be true based on what we have been told. Use you can, your imagination a little bit here. What could be some speculations that we could make about Charlie's life? Okay, so some of your speculations are, he has generous parents, yes, as they give the bed to the grandparents. That's true, it doesn't say, you know, generously, Charlie's parents gave up their bed. It just tells us that they did it. So we're speculating about the character of the parents. Um, He could be humble as he's poor. That's a good point, yes. So we can use kind of evidence of what we might know about, well, the experience of living in poverty, how that might change someone's character. Let's see what else we have. Maybe he doesn't go to school. There's a chance that Charlie might not go to school. Yes, because of his poor um, situation. His parents don't have a steady job. That is true. We don't actually know the reason why they are in this situation, but we could speculate that maybe one of them lost their job or they have a poorly paid job. What else have we got? We could speculate that he's not educated. Yes, we could definitely speculate that because it's unlikely that he'll be able to achieve an extremely, um, you know, good education, perhaps. The family are very close because the grandparents live with them. That We could definitely speculate about that. Could you, I mean, you could also speculate the other way, couldn't you? You could have speculate they all hate each other because they're all fed up with each other. So it just varies on what you think is the most likely. Is Sam is saying they might have been through bankruptcy? Yes, quite possibly. He might not have many friends as they live at the edge of the country. Yes, that's true. They live right on the edge, so maybe their life is quite isolated. We could speculate that they only really have each other. Maybe Charlie doesn't know anybody else. The parents are thoughtful people because they gave up their bed. Yes, that's a good one. They might have bad luck. True, they might just be a family that suffers from a lot of sort of curse of bad luck, perhaps. Maybe they got scammed out of their money. Excellent, okay, very good. So let me show you some of my speculations that I wrote down. So some of you definitely had some similar things to this. So I said that they may have fallen on hard times. Maybe the grandparents are a bit lazy. I don't know anybody, any of you have seen the film or read the whole book, but. I think we could maybe argue that. The family might be close. Yes, some of you said that as they live together. Mr. and Mrs. Bucket might be generous people. Yes, quite a few of you said that. They may be happy to give up the bed or Charlie may be unhappy about being the only child, you know, the only adult, sorry, the only child in the family of adults. Uh, so there we go. So I don't necessarily have a specific piece of evidence for any of these, but I can still speculate based on what I have read. Okay, and then the final uh, type of sort of inference skill that you can practice is examination. And this is where we're being a little bit more specific with the text. So in the other ones, we have just been making comments about it, right? We can deduce this, we can speculate this. Examination is now where you take those ideas and you put them in a very clear format. So this is the most thorough form of evidence. We're looking for the most specific clues and then we're explaining what we learn from them. So you'll need to use PEE to, to structure your answer when you're doing a 
an inference question that requires you to explain in clear detail. So I have got another passage from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Your task now is to answer the question in a PEE format. You're going to be choosing parts of the text, choose your quotations very carefully, and explain how that particular quotation allows you to infer something about Charlie. So let's see if we can practice this. Just, um, I'll just clarify, because sometimes students don't know what PEE stands for. I'll just quickly go over this real quick so that we're happy with what it means. So when you write a PEE answer, you start off with your point. In the, for example, if we're looking at the grandparents one, um, in the story, the grandparents are likely in ill health. That would be my point. Then I would say in my evidence, I know this because the text states, and then I would put my quotation, and then I would explain a little bit further showing how I got to that conclusion. So let's look at this next passage and see if you guys can practice this. So this is leading on from the bit we read before, and I'm gonna read this out, and then I will give you guys a bit of time to write some PEE answers which explain what you can infer about Charlie's character. So for this one, you're going to be looking for your quotes, your relevant short phrases that you're going to use in your answer. So here we go. Let's read it out. Only once a year on his birthday did Charlie Bucket ever get to taste a bit of chocolate. The whole family saved up their money for that special occasion. And when the great day arrived, Charlie was always presented with one small chocolate bar to eat all by himself. And each time he received it on those marvelous birthday mornings, he would place it carefully in a small wooden box that he owned and treasure it as though it were a bar of solid gold. And for the next few days, he would allow himself only to look at it, but never to touch it. Then at last, when he could stand it no longer, he would peel back a tiny bit of the paper wrapping at one corner to expose a tiny bit of chocolate. And then he would take a tiny nibble, just enough to allow the lovely sweet taste to spread out slowly over his tongue. The next day he would take another tiny nibble and so on and so on. And in this way, Charlie would make his sixpenny bar of birthday chocolate last him for more than a month. Okay. So I'm going to give you just a quick example of this before I let you guys try this. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of time to write your answers and put them in the chat. Now I've put a big red box over most of my answers here so that you can't see them all, but I will give you one example so you can see how to structure your answer. So hang on, let me just go back so it's clearer, there we go. So my inference is this, Charlie is a restrained and patient child. Okay, that's my point, my inference. Evidence, the text states, he would allow himself only to look at it, but never to touch it. Now, I've explained further by choosing a key word that I think stood out to me that emphasised Charlie's patience. The use of the word never shows that he is strict with himself and does not give in to the temptation of chocolate easily. So that is your task. I'll put this back up on the screen and I'm going to give you about three minutes so you can write it out in full. And then I will read out some of your answers. So. Actually, I'll give you two minutes, I think, so that we can make the most of the time. So I'm actually going to put a two minute timer on. Two minutes, and then I'll read out some of your answers starting now. Do this side by side so you can see the example as well.
Okay, 30 more seconds. Okay, right. That's my timer going up. So I'm going to read out some of your answers here. Let's have a look. Just scroll back. Now I'm hoping that I will get a point evidence and explain. Okay, let's see. I think Charlie is very gracious as it says that he treasures the chocolate bar like it is solid gold. This explains that he values the small portion of things that he has. Yeah, that's a great answer. It's in a clear PEE structure. He's grateful, as it says, he treasures it as though it were a bar of solid gold. This shows he's grateful for every little thing he has and treasures it. Yes, but don't repeat. Don't repeat what you've said in your evidence in the explanation, because then what's the point of the explanation? Just say, he is grateful for every little thing he has, perhaps because he has so little or because of his um, lack of lack of wealth in his everyday life. Okay, I'm only gonna read out the ones that are in the PEE structure. Some of these are just sentences. You need the quotation. Charlie is grateful for what he receives because he treasures the chocolate bar that he is given every year on his birthday. This is shown by the phrase, treasure it as though it were a bar of solid gold. As his family are so poor, he finds this a big treat. Yes, good. A lot of these are just sentences. I didn't want you to do that. I wanted you to write me a PEE as I said multiple times. So if you haven't done that, I'm not going to read out your answer. Okay, this, this is a starting point. Yes, Charlie is able to control himself by not eating a whole chocolate bar. I know this because in the text it says he would take a tiny nibble. Yes, but then you need to explain. Okay, well, why? Why does he take a tiny nibble? Because he knows he has to make the most of it because he doesn't often get chocolate. Charlie is a patient and understanding child. I know this because the text says that he would only allow himself to look at it but never to touch it. This shows that Charlie is patient. You've already said that, you don't need to say that again. He's also understanding because he preserves the chocolate for a very long time and he knows that having chocolate was a very big thing. Well, true, he's appreciative of the chocolate because he understands that he's not gonna get it very often. Family is not wealthy. Yes, but that one is not related to Charlie. Charlie is quite frugal. We can infer this by the quote, he would only have a tiny, that quotation doesn't make full, it's not a full sentence, so the quotation doesn't make sense. Point the family cared for Charlie. Yes, but that wasn't my question. I didn't ask what the family thought, I asked what Charlie is like. Just looking through to see if there's any other answers that I want to read out. Charlie can control himself and can discipline himself. Evidence, only once a year on his birthday did Charlie Bucket ever get to taste a bit of chocolate. The word ever makes this quote dramatic. Good, yes, the quote only once a year tells us that his family are poor and can't get them very often. Yeah, that's good. Okay, there's a lot of good answers here. A lot of them are quite short and aren't following the structure that I asked for. So please do use that structure, it's there to help you. So let me give you a couple of other um, examples before we move on. So I'll just remove the box here. So here's my second one, inference. Charlie is loved by his family. The text states, the whole family saved up their money for that special occasion. 
I've explained Charlie's birthday is viewed as special by the rest of the family who want to treat him by devoting all their spare money to give him a gift. Or we've got the third one there. Charlie is a frugal boy. My evidence was Charlie would, quote, peel back a tiny bit of the paper to show just a tiny bit of the chocolate and would take a tiny nibble. Now, someone did pick up on this. Someone did say that there was repetition of um, tiny, which is great. The repetition of tiny shows us that he only eats the smallest amount each time to make it last as long as possible. So you can see each of those answers, it's three separate sentences, right? It's a statement, then it's um, a piece of evidence in a, its own sentence, and then it's explained as well. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you all. Let's move on. I have got one more of these for you to try. Let me just go on to single page. Now, you may know <laughs> in this book that we have, of course, the Charlie Bucket and, and the family, but the also other main character is, of course, Willy Wonka himself. So this part here, this is about Willy Wonka, and I want you to do what we just did, your PEE -E paragraphs, but based on this paragraph. What can you infer about Willy Wonka as a person based on this section from the book. This is the bit, if any of you have read the book, where he announces that he's going to put this competition out for the golden ticket. Okay, so let's read it out and then be selecting the quotes from the text that you think allow you to infer something about him. So, Mr. Willy Wonka, the confectionery genius whom nobody had seen for the last 10 years, sent out the following notice today. I, Willy Wonka, have decided to allow five children, just five, mind you, and no more, to visit my factory this year. These lucky five will be shown around personally by me and they will be allowed to see all the secrets and the magic of my factory. Then, at the end of the tour, as a special present, all of them will be given enough chocolates and sweets to last them for the rest of their lives. So watch out for the golden tickets. Five golden tickets have been printed on golden paper, and these five golden tickets have been hidden underneath the ordinary wrapping paper of five ordinary bars of chocolate. These five chocolate bars may be anywhere, in any shop, in any street, in any town, in any country in the world upon any counter where Wonka sweets are sold. And the five lucky finders of these five golden tickets are the only ones who will be allowed to visit my factory and see what it's like now inside. Good luck to you all and happy hunting. All right, so same thing as before. Let me get my two minute timer. I'm also going to do it side by side here so that you can see the way I want you to structure these answers. If you don't structure it like this, I won't read out your answer. I'm going to be strict. <laughs> that is how you get the best marks, is by following a clear structure that will allow your examiner to, to see clearly. Ah, yes. One, two, three. Tick, tick, tick. Right. Let's do two minutes on the timer, starting now. Already see a couple of good answers in the chat, but I'll just give everyone a couple of minutes.
Okay, about 20 seconds. Right, just turn that off before the timer starts beeping away. Okay, let me say this one more time because I can see that people are not listening to what I'm saying. If you just send me one sentence, I will not read out your answer. That is not sufficient. It needs to be in this structure. So I can see a lot of you have done that, but if you want me to actually give you feedback, do what I ask because that is the best way to practice this is to get it in that structure. Right, sorry to be strict, but I want you guys to do really well. Let me just go back a little bit and find the first answers. Okay, here's a good answer. So he is a very secretive person because it says, whom nobody had seen for the last 10 years. This suggests that he doesn't like being in the spotlight. Excellent, that is perfect. Then the next few there are only one sentence. Okay. Willy Wonka is a generous man. This is shown by the phrase, all of them will be given enough chocolates and sweets for the rest of their lives. He's trying to promote the number of people who buy his sweets by doing this, as many people will start buying chocolate bars in the hope of getting a golden ticket. Right, that's making two separate points. The first one is saying that he's generous and the second is saying that he's sneaky, right? He's actually using this to promote himself. So he's not so generous as it seems, perhaps. Maybe he's actually kind of being selfish here. So with that one, you can get perhaps, maybe separate that into two separate points about Willy Wonka. Okay, go back a little bit. He's a very dramatic person, okay. Willy Wonka is a very dramatic person. He repeats any, when he says any shop, any country, any street, he knows where the sweets are as he put them there, but he says that to be dramatic. Yeah, that's an excellent answer. He does, he wants to ramp up the excitement, doesn't he, to say that anybody could possibly get it in their sweet shop. Excellent. Uh, let's see. He is bossy, decisive, and boastful. The evidence is he's decided to allow five children no more to visit my factory this year. And the phrase no more tells us that he is very decisive and bossy. Good, he's, well, yes, your explanation is kind of just repeating the point, but you'd wanna say, this suggests that he is creating a limit on how many people come into his factory and he's being very strict about it. Try and say your explanation in a different way to your point. Let's see. Okay, I can infer that Willy Wonka is a generous but secretive person. I know this because it says he's allowing five children into his factory if they find a golden ticket. This implies he is generous, but it also says that he was not seen for 10 years, which means that he is secretive. Yes, and also think about it. If he's only allowing five children in, that's also quite secretive, right? Okay, this is a good one. He's a very proud man. It emphasizes that he, the factory is very special and magical. That's the quote, good. This suggests he thinks very highly of himself. Excellent. He's a very cryptic person. We know this is the text states that nobody had seen him for the last 10 years. This shows us how mysterious he is. Yeah, good. Yeah, um, a lot of these are the idea about being generous, which is good. If you if you said about the generosity, that's excellent. This is another interesting one. He's a very good businessman and he's very creative. Yes. So the five chocolate bars may be anywhere, in any shop, in any sweet street, in any country. This shows that everyone will be buying his chocolates to enter the competition and has created this wonderful idea for everyone. Yeah, excellent. Very savvy, isn't it, really? Uh, okay, he is suspicious and mysterious. The text states, whom nobody had seen for the last 10 years. The use of nobody and the phrase last 10 years shows that he hasn't been seen and now he's just reappeared giving five lucky children a prize. Yeah, that's a great answer. 
I'll do one more for now, but a lot of these are looking good. I can see you are all taking my <laughs> my commands on board here. Uh, Mr. Wonka is very proud of his factory. The evidence is these five will be shown around personally by me. Evidence. He repeats I and my often in his advert. Yes, excellent personal pronouns. He wants to show the five children around the factory himself. Yes. And then I would say, suggest, which suggests that he is proud of it or suggests that he feels a sense of ownership over it. Okay, very good. I think there's a lot of good answers in there. Well done, everybody. I can already see great improvement. So well done. Excellent. I am going to give you a few um, suggestions that I had. I'll show you this. Hang on a second. Let me just change over the page. So these are some of the inferences that I made. Obviously, I haven't written them as PEE. These are just the main inferences. So I said he's a generous factory owner. A lot of you said that. He enjoys being mysterious and elusive. He enjoys creating a spectacle. He's an extravagant person. He's very rich. He's proud of who he is. He enjoys attention. And this is the... Uh, example that I gave. This is my PEE that I wrote. So Willy Wonka seems to enjoy being a mysterious and elusive character. Actually, a lot of you said something very similar to this. Firstly, he has not been seen for the last 10 years, and he states that these five children are, oh, I've just realized a small typo. Remove that. Are the only ones who will be allowed to visit my factory and see what it's like now inside. So the use of the phrase only ones allows him to create a feeling of exclusivity. And the word now implies that the factory has recently been changed in ways that only a select few will get to witness. So he likes to build up all this allure around him. Okay, some excellent work, everybody. Let's move on. So I have got, how long do we have? About 20 minutes or so. Let me just think, what can I use the time most effectively for? I think I will do one more short task um, to do with the um, these written answers. And then we might have a quick look at a bit of um, some literary devices and see if we can make inferences from them. Okay, so a few little uh, pieces of exam uh, advice and exam tips and techniques uh, here for a moment. So when you're doing inference questions, obviously, the way we've been practicing it now, that's going to be for exams that have written answers. Now, obviously there are going to be some that will involve multiple choice. So you don't need to write your answers out in full and you probably won't need to give evidence, but you can still practice your inference because that will help you to answer those multiple choice questions as well. So when you're doing these written answers, make sure that you look at the marks that have been offered for each question, right? That's the first thing to do. Usually, I would say that an inference question with PEE is roughly one PEE paragraph per two or three marks. So if the question is worth like four marks, write two PEE paragraphs. It should be that you spend one minute per mark on inference questions. So offer the same number of inferences as the amount of marks if you are... If it says, what do you learn about so-and-so? What can you infer about so-and-so? You can state your clear points. That's kind of a deduction question. If it asks you to give evidence, the evidence part is also going to be worth its own mark. You can look out for openers to the questions, which kind of look something like this. So what do you learn about? What do you know about? Describe the character of, what sort of character is? How do you know? Sometimes they do use the word infer, but I haven't seen that very much. So don't rely on them saying, what do you infer about a character? And remember to choose supporting quotations that are directly relevant to your answer. Sometimes I see students inferring something and then they've used a quote that is not really related. So it has to be very specific evidence. Now, here are some useful phrases that you can use. I think a lot of you did this pretty nicely, but some of you are just writing the quotes by themselves. So it's a good idea to be able to introduce your evidence. Here are some ways you can do that. This is shown through the phrase. I know this because the writer says, blah, blah, blah. This can be inferred because, this is evident because. 
This is demonstrated by the phrase. This is shown by the phrase. First two are quite similar, really. So try and do that. Try and introduce your quotation so that it makes a full sentence rather than just shoving it in by itself. Your answer will flow much more easily then. Okay, I think I would like to move on to a little bit of literary devices at this point for the last 15 minutes or so, because literary devices actually can be a big part of inference because they can really help us to understand what we're supposed to know, what we're supposed to understand about a character, but sometimes we have to think a little bit more carefully about them. So first of all, uh, before I do, um, no, sorry, I can't go back. Um, before I move on to the literary devices, can anyone please tell me what do I mean by a literary device? What is a literary device? Can anyone put it in the chat? Literary devices, does anyone want to tell me what I mean by a literary device? Yes, figurative language, writing techniques, personification, simile, etc. Yeah, all that kind of thing, exactly. So sometimes, as you can see, we kind of started to do this a little bit with our PEE. Um, some of you were noticing repetition or you were noticing like the particular use of pronouns. So literary devices are kind of like that, right? They're features of the language that the writer uses to make their point clear. So when you are inferring, sometimes it's useful to use the literary devices to support your point. So I have got for you, I'm just scroll down a few slides. I've got for you a little poem that we're going to read. And this poem, I don't know if any of you will recognize it. It's called The Fish. <laughs> um, it's about a fish called The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop. I think that's the name of the poet. And so I'm going to read this out. So your task here is to, first of all, look for the literary devices that you notice. And there's quite a lot in this passage. And then we're going to see if we can use those literary devices to help us infer how the reader feels about the fish, what the fish is like, what impressions we get of this fish, anything you can infer about it, you can explain. I can see you all writing down lots of literary devices in the text. Yes. Okay, let's read out the poem and be on the lookout for literary devices that you think would be useful to use for inference. Here and there, his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, and its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses, stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice. And underneath, two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood, that can cut so badly, I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. Okay, so hopefully you've noticed that there's quite a lot of literary techniques in this passage. So I can see people are writing things in the chat. Okay, there's no point just writing simile guys. How am I gonna know what you're referring to? Please be specific. I can see a lot of you have written stuff down, but you haven't really told me what they are. So can you please be specific, write down the actual simile or whatever it is that you've noticed so we can highlight it. Okay, so let's start. We have got the wallpaper simile, let's highlight that. Um, we've got the strips. Yes, the hung in strips is sort of like a bit of a, well, 
it's sort of quite actually that could be more literal so actually i won't say that's a metaphor but by making it sound like wallpaper it could kind of sound like it's a metaphor um we've also got the like a big peony simile there some of you have noticed white flesh packed in like feathers there's another simile there brilliant There's a metaphor, yes, fine rosettes of lime. We'll do the metaphors in green. A peony, for those of you who aren't sure, it's like a flower. It's a big pink flower with like lots of petals. Full blown roses as well, yes, excellent. You might be able to notice some of the similarities in the language that the writer is using to portray this fish. A lot of the, the, the language is kind of similar. I'm not gonna say how, because I want you guys to talk about this yourselves, but I think you might be able to notice some similar patterns. Just looking through what else got, okay, rags of green weed, that would be a metaphor. Um, I have noticed a few people talking about um, a bit of juxtaposition, but I, I'm, I'm not sure which people are referring to. They've said juxtaposition, but maybe you can be specific. Big bones and little bones. Mm. That juxtaposition. Sort of a little contrast within a line, I guess. We can highlight it. Showing his variety. I'm also going to highlight this. Um, the yellow one above, terrible oxygen. Can anyone tell me what technique that is? Terrible oxygen would be an example of what? Good, it's an oxymoron. A couple of you have noticed that. Excellent. So you've got a couple of contrasts there. You've got the oxymoron of terrible oxygen. You've got the big bones, little bones. I'm not sure I would say that's juxtaposition, but um, it could definitely show the variety and complexity of his appearance. Some of you have said fresh and crisp with blood is a metaphor. No, it's not. That's just a literal phrase. I can think for now, um, let's stick with those ones. So what I would like you guys to do is think about what can you infer about the writer's feelings about the fish based on these literary techniques, okay? So not about the fish itself, but the writer's feelings towards the fish based on the way that she's described it. Her use of language, her use of techniques, her use of descriptions, how does she feel about this fish? Now, I this is only a small excerpt of the poem. The, the actual poem is a lot longer, but she is she has captured the fish, but she's caught the fish. So she's looking at it out of the sea. So that might give you a bit of a, an idea of how, why she's looking at it so close up. Dramatic reds and blacks is a metaphor. No, it's not. It's just a phrase. We have got the colors, because a color, a red color can be, just be a dramatic red. It doesn't have to be personification. It's not saying that the, the the red is like putting on a show or something like that. So don't read too much into it. You know, you've got to be very, very sure that your techniques are the techniques that they are. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes and I would like you, like before, put it in your PEE structure, please. I don't want just short answers. I want a full three-part answer. I can see a couple of good points there. 
couple of questions. What does entrails mean? Entrails are like your insides. To see if there's any other questions. Okay, I've had a couple of questions um, about people have missed slides. I will send you all of these slides after the session. I can't go back and show you them now, but I will show you them. I'll send them to you. What are barnacles? Barnacles are um, like little shells. Okay, let's do two minutes to see if anyone can write me a really clear PEE -E paragraph analyzing that quotation really clearly to show us how the poet feels about the fish. Right, I'm starting the timer now. When we are doing PEE, do we write about five lines? Well, there only needs to be three sentences, a short point, your evidence in a full sentence, and then an explanation. I would say three lines if you can. Three sentences. You can see some of you are sending me answers, but they're not in PEE, there's no quote. We've done this several times now. Come on, you must be doing what I've asked, otherwise it's not gonna be a sufficient answer. It needs to be point, own sentence. Evidence, its own sentence. Explanation, its own sentence. I'm sorry to be strict, but I want you guys to do this really effectively. I don't want you to do answers that aren't gonna get you all the marks you could possibly get. Think particularly as well, I mentioned this before, the way she's describing the fish, ancient wallpaper, full blown roses, rosettes, like a peony, like feathers. Think about what do all those images have in common? Okay, I can definitely see someone has picked up on that. Excellent, okay, I'll give you guys a couple, another minute or so. Okay, 20 more seconds. Let's just scroll up again. Okay, I'm going to read out some of the answers that I think have understood the poem um, the most accurately. This one is really good. The poet sees the fish as elegant. I can infer this from her use of similes such as peonies and roses. Excellent, yes, you've got it. She compares the fish to a variety of flowers that are often used to represent beauty. Exactly, exactly, that is exactly it. There is ugliness in this fish, but she admires its beauty nonetheless. Let's see what else, anyone else has said something similar to that? She feels sorry for the fish. I know this because it says, while its gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen. I know this, that she, I know that she doesn't like the fish bringing in the oxygen that has been produced from land. Yes, good. So the oxymoron there, ironically for the fish, oxygen is terrible. Something that we see as essential, right? It sees as terrible. So she's, yeah, she's pitying it. She wants it to be perhaps released back into the sea so it can breathe again. Let's see what else. The poet is entranced by the fish's body designs. I know this because the text says, I thought. 
this quotation tells us that she's reflecting on the fish. I mean, yes, for that one, I would be more specific. I would say I thought of the coarse white flesh like feathers, packed in like feathers. So try and use a slightly longer quotation, but yeah, you're showing that there's this sense of admiration and she's looking at it in every detail, admiring its beauty, even though it's, so it's something that's quite ugly, it does look like it has bits of rag, you know, hanging off of it and it looks like it's peeling. N nonetheless, she sees it as beautiful. Just having a look, see if anybody else has got. Some of these answers, they're just, they're, they're good, but they're not quite specific enough. The best answer definitely was the one about the comparisons to all the flowers. It's just, I'm just reading through some of these answers. How it's shown us the deeper features of one ordinary fish into something enthralling. She's showing us how amazing the fish is. For example, big bones and little bones. This exp the explanation, she's explaining every single bit of just one fish into something extraordinary. Yeah, you've got some, you cl on the right lines there, the phrase big bones and little bones, it shows that she's, you know, perhaps um, in awe of the fish's complexity and variety. The writer feels that the fish is very ancient and beautiful. The simile like ancient wallpapers suggests the fish must be very old, and the phrase, the pink swim bladder like a big peony, suggests that the fish is elegant. That's nice. And what you've noticed there is that there's a juxtaposition, there's contrast between the oldness of the decaying wallpaper and the beauty of the big, full flower, right? It's got both ugliness and beauty within the same image. I might just read out one more. I think a lot of the other points that the best answers here are the ones that really think about the meaning behind the quotation. Some of your answers are just a little bit too simplistic. I'm not gonna read them out too much because I don't want to single anybody out in particular, but I do want you guys to be thinking a bit more carefully about the, the uses of the literary devices, right? So fine rosettes of lime. Now lime is basically like um, a, a, a form of mold, right? It's like, what well, you know, it's like lime scale that you get around your tap. Once the water is like all gone all chunky. So, but a rosette is something, it's a beautiful flower. So she's saying that even the ugliness, even the mold on the fish's skin looks like a beautiful flower. And even, you know, its flesh is described as being like feathers. That shows the intricacy and the detail of each aspect of this fish's appearance. So even though some of you have got some good answers there, just for this one, Think a bit more carefully about what that quotation shows you about the, the way the poet feels. Think a little bit below the surface. Okay, I think I'm going to have to leave it there for today because I've run out of time. Um, but thank you everybody so much for all of your contributions. And hopefully there was something there to challenge you and to push you. Now when you're looking more at your literary devices, think in more detail, break it up and consider what is the writer using this quotation to show us? So I will pause here. This is the point at which you can um, invite any parents who would like to come and ask questions. This is their opportunity to do so. Um, and I will be happy to answer any questions about English and um, clear up any worries. So thanks everyone again. And we will move on to the Q and A at this point. Thank you so much, Lewis. That was a wonderful session. And thank you guys for sitting uh, through it. And thank you for attending the session. Uh, we would like to offer a 30% discount to you 
for today. And you can use the Master 30 coupon uh, and utilize it. You can go through Pi Academy's uh, courses and subscriptions and uh, utilize this uh, coupon. So I would be sharing my screen and walking you through our uh, website so you can understand uh, what exactly would help you. So for those of you who are looking for more comprehension and creative writing related courses, you can check out our 11 plus courses page. So essentially on our website, you just head over to 11 plus courses and you can see the 11 plus October half term courses have been released and you can sign up for the 11 plus comprehension and creative writing half term courses, which are taken by Lewis. So you can uh, carry on your uh, learning and we really hope you like the session. Uh, I hope you understood about the PE technique and uh, now you're comfortable with literary devices. So yes, you can explore our website and we would like to reiterate that you can utilize the Master 30 coupon and uh, check out our website, check out our courses and register for those that you like. And I request you all to please ask your parents to join us for the Q&A session. You can drop your questions here in the chat uh, chat box and we would take the answers. So yes, I would also like to introduce you to our brand new bundle plan. So we have launched the 11 plus silver, diamond and gold plans. And I would like to just walk you through what you would be getting in each of these plans. So in the 11 plus silver, diamond and gold plans, you would be able to unlock all 11 plus related subscriptions. So this includes all our maths, English, verbal, non-verbal practice papers. Uh, this also includes our uh, board specific papers. For example, we have CEM, GL, SCT, CSSE specific board papers. You would be able to unlock all of these. You would be able to unlock 14 mock exams and six video courses. So with the 11 plus silver, diamond and gold plan, with all these three plans, you can unlock all the 11 plus subscriptions. Now, for those who are looking for a more comprehensive solution, those who are looking for, say, uh, a tutoring oriented approach to the 11 plus exams, you can check out our 11 plus diamond and gold plans because these plans come with the 11 plus live weekend classes. So essentially the 11 plus live weekend classes are held every Sunday. They go on for two and a half hours and we cover maths, English, VR and NVR subjects in these classes. So with the diamond and the gold plan, you would be able to access the 11 plus live weekend classes along with all our 11 plus paper subscriptions. So the only difference between the diamond and gold plan is essentially how you would be billed. The, the diamond plan is annual in nature. So you would be essentially booking your seat for the next one year. And the gold plan is monthly in nature. So you would be accessing all the information and material for one month. And today's coupon code, which is master30, that is applicable on the 11 plus diamond plan. So feel free to uh, explore all these three options. Select the one that makes more sense to you and utilize the coupon code, which is uh, uh, valid for only today. So we have a few questions from Arnab. Are there any CATS or SATS test papers? So yes, we do have uh, CATS and SATS test papers. You just need to check out our 11 plus practice papers. We also have pre-test uh, pre papers. So we have our CAT for online practice tests and, and the UKISCT practice tests. So you can uh, explore these. So yes, guys, please uh, post your questions in the chat box and please do explore our newly launched bundles, which are the 11 plus silver, diamond and gold plans. And we have also launched the 11 plus exam October half term courses. So you can explore the courses. Uh, you can see what all subjects we are, we've launched. And so we have... Uh, essentially, we have the Independent School Max Booster course for students who are writing exams this year. We have the Comprehension Half Term course, Creative Writing, Verbal Reasoning, Geometry, Algebra, Nonverbal Reasoning. And for those of you who are sitting for interview workshops, you can also get in touch with us in case you want to have an interview, mock interview session. 
We have a question from Riyanch. How to improve in framing answers to inference style questions as it requires reading between the lines? Oh, I don't, can you read me that question one more time? Because I can't, I don't think it's on my chat. Yes, how to improve in framing answers to inference style questions as it requires reading between the lines. Yes. OK, so this is basically what we were practicing today um, is essentially you want to use PEE. That is your complete uh, like lifesaver, I would say, for inference questions. It does involve re reading between the lines, but that's not how you would frame your answer. So there's basically two parts of your of your question here. One is about the reading between the lines part and the other is about framing the question. The, the question would always be answered in PEE, that is if it's a descriptive paper that you're doing. But when it comes to reading between the lines, that is something that you need to practice separately. You, if your child is struggling to actually get the answers in the first place, they need to practice actually learning how to read between the lines first. So what you would do with that is you need to read loads with them, first of all, and every time you read, ask them what they can learn about a character based on the way they talk, based on the way that they act, based on the way they interact with, with people. Ask them questions about the text that aren't immediately there, you know, stated. This is something you just have to build up over time. And then once they are comfortable with that, you can start them practicing in their PEE structure. So they maybe state a very clear point. They are able to find the evidence that supports it and then they explain it. So it should be always in that PEE structure. Um, so you need to practice the reading between the lines element as a overall skill that you do alongside reading. And once they are com comfortable with that, then you can start them planning and, and using that structure to answer the questions. So I hope that roughly answers the question. There's a, a somewhat related question. Are there any recommended books to purchase? I assume that you mean to read, as in like reading books. I would always recommend for students who want to improve their ability to read more challenging and, and to understand things that are more challenging, go for books that are written like at the end of the sort of the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. So anything that, because right now our books are too easy, like books that are written and published at the moment, the language is just too simple. So you need to get them reading classics. So you can do a Google search, classic children's books, anything there will be great. Um, anything that is, you know, if you can get them reading a bit of Dickens, if you can get them reading some Austin, so the classic writers, those are the ones that their writing is challenging enough, but also accessible. So for example, Oliver Twist is hard in the language, but also still fairly accessible as a story. So I would get them to focus on reading more of the classic novels they're going to be harder but they will really really improve their reading ability so we have a question from arna how wide is the range of topics in 10 minute tests so uh you can explore our 10 minute tests under 11 plus papers so under 11 plus papers we have 11 plus revision and practice so over here, we have 90 10 minute tests, and these are segregated topic wise. As you can see for English, we have nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, clauses, phrases, goes on to punctuation, spelling, literary devices, comprehension. And then under max, we have numbers, algebra, ratios, geometry, statistics, and counting. So these are topic wise short 10 minute tests and you can utilize them for quick revisions. Aryahi has a question. How do you answer the questions like explain in your own words? Okay, so that is a, that's a specific skill which we would call paraphrasing. Um, it is essentially you have to retell the story, but using your own words. So this is where students are going to need a good range of synonym knowledge so that they can retell something. The way I get the students to practice this is I just give them sentences, simple sentences, or even I just 
choose a random phrase, a random sentence from a book, and I say, rewrite this sentence. So the meaning stays the same, but all the words are different. You can even say, you cannot use any of the words in the original sentence. It's a good way for them to practice it. Explaining in your own words, the one thing you must remember about this is do not just copy the passage. It's very tempting. And a lot of students, obviously, they are used to having to use evidence. But if it says explain your own words, you must not use evidence. That is the key thing. Just put it into your own way of saying it. Use your synonyms and try and rephrase it. Rearrange the sentence so you're still saying the same meaning. Yes. So essentially, it takes a lot of practice. And if you guys register for the 11 plus comprehension and creative writing courses for October half term, you would get uh, a lot of opportunity to uh, essentially structure your answers with Lewis in a more mm -hmm. detailed manner. Yes, we have a whole on the comprehension half term course. There is a whole day on paraphrasing. So if that's something you're struggling with, we do a whole session on that. Uh, so that will be a useful way to improve. So Arnav has a question. Is there any way to strengthen topics, i.e. methods? So assuming, anyway. yeah, assuming this is about 11 plus maths, uh, we generally fo follow a three-step approach to any 11 plus maths topic. The first is to make sure that the child's concepts are extremely clear and the topic has been introduced in a very structured manner to the child. The second is to essentially help the child expose them to as many different types of question patterns as possible. And then the third is to have very frequent uh, short assessments to see exactly how much the child has learned and how far they need to go. So when it comes to uh, uh, 11 plus maths, when we want to go topic wise, this is the method we follow. Lewis can give us a little more insight into in English. Um, yes, sure. But for English, I typically say that there are basically three aspects to English, but obviously each of those is broken down. So we have comprehension, creative writing, and then you have SPAG. And the best way that if you want to kind of break down each of those, we have our video courses that split it into sort of seven or nine sections, different skills that you need to learn. Uh, so, you know, inference, your PEE, vocabulary and context, author's choice, summary, predictions. So we split it into topics like that. Then for creative writing, we also offer in the video course lots and lots of different styles of writing, persuasive, narrative, you know, expository, diary writing, you know, speeches, everything like that. So we've divided it up like that for you on the video courses, which I think would be a, a good place to start if you want to cover everything in a fairly short, manageable um, amount of time. So that's kind of how we've done it. That's how we can provide help with that. Yes. And I would just write, like to reiterate that the 11 plus video courses, which are 11 plus creative writing, comprehension, algebra, geometry, fractions, all of these courses are essentially under each of these plans. So if you uh, go, whether you go for the 11 plus silver plan, diamond plan or gold plan, you will be able to access all six video courses. So do give, uh, do uh, take a look at this page, which is essentially under pricing, you would be able to see 11 plus exam monthly subscriptions. And do go through these, go through all the subscriptions that you would be able to access with this plan. And kindly do remember that you can utilize today's coupon code, which is master 30 on the 11 plus diamond plan. So after utilizing the coupon code uh, uh, on a monthly basis, it comes down to around 35 pounds per month, which is extremely budget friendly. So please do take a look uh, at this course. Shyam is asking, is there a Pi Academy 11 plus reading list? So we will share uh, a list of books that Lewis has recommended. Uh, Lewis can also walk you through a couple of the uh, recommended books right now. Um, yes. Now, off the top of my head, I got, I'm trying to remember what books I put on that list because there's quite a lot. Um, but 
as I said before, you know, the reading books that I always recommend are going to be the more classic ones. So I think that I've recommended various um, Dickens books. I think I've recommended some E. Nesbitt. So like Five Children and It, um, The Phoenix in the Carpet. I think there's Secret Garden is on there. I think The Railway Children, you know, all these classics that we're familiar with that so frequently come up in exams as well. Like they're often used as the exam passages. So it's books like that that are on there and then there will be some more moderner one moderner <laughs> some more modern ones i think the hobbit um tolkien is on there i think i put some northern the northern lights series on there as well so there is a real range for different tastes as well different styles so hopefully there'll be something on there that your student or your child uh, will get on well with Yes, we will be sharing the list with you over email. We would also be sharing the lecture notes so that you can have a quick revision if you want. And with this, I would like to conclude the session. Thank you so much for joining us. I would like to reiterate the coupon code is MASTER30 and it is only valid for today. So please do explore uh, Pi Academy and definitely explore our bundle plans because they pack a lot in it. So. Uh, you can access around 30,000 questions, which are all 11 plus uh, exam related. And you can also unlock one year worth of live weekend classes with our 11 plus diamond plan. And the coupon code for today, Master30, is valid only on the 11 plus diamond plan. So please do take a look. And thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis, for the wonderful session. And we would uh, see you guys next Sunday. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.